Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, we're looking at who invented nachos and why are they called that. Just before we get started today, I do want to say that this video is made possible by Cheddar. You might know Cheddar from their live news network or their cool product reviews on Facebook, but now they are making weekly YouTube videos. And if you like Today I Found Out, you'll also love their videos. They recently made one about America's most expensive nachos. You can see why I tied it into this video. Things have come a really long way with those. So check it out through the link in the description below. And let's get started with today's video. Prior to the 1940s, the word nacho had two meanings. One was a Tex-Mex slang combining the word naturally and, of course, into nacho. The other was a common nickname for a small boy whose name was Ignacio. Basically, the Mexican equivalent of calling a boy named William Billy or a boy named Timothy Timmy. Discovery of this latter fact led Adriana Orr from the Oxford English Dictionary in a search to see if there was an Ignacio behind nachos. What she ultimately found was a man named Ignacio Anaya Sr., who, while he probably wasn't the first person to ever decide to mix tortilla chips with melted cheese and jalapenos, does seem to be the person directly responsible for nachos becoming a thing, along with lending his name to the food item. The nacho story begins in the early 1940s in the town of Piedras Negras in Mexico, which is a only four miles from the American border and near Eagle Pass, Texas. This was the site of the historic Fort Duncan, which during World War II was used as a support facility for the nearby Eagle Pass Army airfield. With the border only a few miles away, many who were stationed in the region often traveled into Mexico to get a better bite to eat. And this is where details of the legend get deliciously murky. To wit, in Piedras Negras, a favorite restaurant of the border-crossing Americans was the patriotically named Victory Club. At the time, it was owned by one Rodolfo de los Santos. Another such restaurant in the town was the Old Moderno Restaurant. Both establishments featured a common worker, the aforementioned Ignacio Anya Senior, who was more affectionately known as Nacho Anaya. Stories are mixed, including ones featuring interviews with Anaya Sr. himself as to which he was working at when he first whipped up the appetizer that would come to bear his name. While there are various tellings of this tale, according to an article by Clarence J. LaRoche published on May 23, 1954, in the San Antonio Express, which was titled Nachos, Natch, the first known account of the origin of Nachos, Ignacio himself, told LaRoche that one night a group of customers, often variously claimed to have been soldiers or soldiers' wives, tired of the normal fare and came in asking for something completely new. LaRoche then stated that Ignacio told him, Honestly, I didn't have the least idea what I was going to try, but I went into the kitchen, looked around, and started groping for an idea. I saw a bowl of freshly fried pieces of tortilla. Then I figured some grated cheese on them might be all right. Well, I got the cheese and began sprinkling the tortilla pieces with it. About this time, I got the idea to put some jalapeno strips atop the cheese. I got the jalapeno, and as I finished putting the strips on the cheese, I decided it would be a good idea to put the whole thing into the oven to melt the cheese. In a 1969 interview appearing in the San Antonio Express and News, he would further state that his recipe for nachos was mostly just a variation on quesadillas his foster mother used to make him as a child. When the customers asked what the dish was called, he told them nachos especiales. Within days, patrons were clamoring for nachos special, and Anaya was teaching other workers at the pair of restaurants how to make them. He soon began experimenting with variations on the original, including adding refried beans and guacamole. It should also be noted that the original date of the first nachos is disputed. It was claimed both in the aforementioned 1954 San Antonio Express interview, as well as in a Corpus Christi Times interview in 1974, that Ignacio said he first whipped them up in 1940. But in both cases, this wasn't a direct quote from him, just these articles claiming that he said that. If this is true, it would call into question the commonly stated soldier or soldier's wives angle, as Fort Duncan wasn't made into a military base in World War II until 1942, and Eagle Pass Army Airfield wasn't activated until that same year. However, most sources, including Ignacio Jr., state that the correct year was actually 1943. Whatever the case, during the 1940s, the appetizer began to spread along the Texas-Mexico border towns under the name Nachos Especiales. Indeed, one of the first known documented instances of this occurred in 1949 in A Taste of Texas by Jane Trahe. There's a little restaurant in the small Mexican town of Villa Acuna that serves some of the finest food in the world. For part of World War II, Mr. Julian Cross, managing editor of the San Antonio Express, was stationed on the Rio Grande border. One night, a small group of officers, one terribly homesick, decided to visit Pedro, their favorite waiter there. Like all Latins, Pedro couldn't stand there on happiness. He did everything but stand on his head to cheer his morose, uniformed guest. When nothing, including the martinis, worked, Pedro left. Sometime later, he returned carrying a large dish 
of Nachos Especiales. These nachos, said Pedro, will help El Capitan. Soon he will forget his troubles, for nachos make one romantic. It goes on to give the recipe as one package Mexican tortillas, a small hunk of American cheese, a bottle or can of pickled peppers, preferably jalapenos. Cut tortillas into small triangular pieces, place in a pan, and put in a medium hot oven to toast. Remove from the oven when barely crisp. Put a small piece of cheese on each piece of tortilla. Replace in the oven until the cheese is melted. Remove from oven and garnish each piece with a small slice of pickled pepper and serve. A year before this, nachos appeared in the San Antonio Light in an advertisement for the Latin Quarter Mexican restaurant. Nachos, Mexican hoarder herbs, 35 cents. Here is a real dainty, golden fried tortilla strips deliciously spiced, topped with mellow melted cheese and garnished with chili jalapeno bits. As for Anaya Senior himself, he would go on to open his own restaurant, Nachos Restaurant in Piedras Negras, where Nachos Especiales were featured on the menu. By 1959, Nachos would make the jump to the West Coast thanks to a young woman named Carmen Rocha, who moved from San Antonio to LA with her husband. Since San Antonio is less than a three-hour drive from Piedras Negras, she had grown up with the Nachos. When Rocha got a job serving at El Cholo Mexican Restaurant on Los Angeles' Western Avenue, she told the chefs about the easy and quick to make tasty snack that she used to eat as a teen that was called nachos. Decades later, El Cholo had become an LA institution, thanks in large part to Rocha and her nachos. When she died in 2008, even El Cholo regular Jack Nicholson grieved, telling the LA Times, Carmen was wonderful to me and to everybody. It's a community loss. While Rocha's introduction of nachos to the West Coast surely contributed to its popularization, there is no bigger influence on how nachos are consumed today than Frank Liberto. Liberto is also known as being the father of nachos. He's the man who introduced so-called fast food or stadium nachos, the ones with the gooey yellow cheese-like substance, to sports stadiums and movie theaters. With his family originally hailing from Sicily, Liberto took over the San Antonio-based family food business from his father, Rico Liberto, selling concessions. In fact, the company was perhaps the first American concession-focused business, even pioneering the selling of peanuts at the circus. As for the tale of the evolution and popularization of nachos, at a Texas Rangers baseball game in Arlington in 1976, Liberto's company Rico's sold the very first stadium nachos, featuring a jalapeno cheese sauce Liberto had come up with. The advantage here over melting grated cheese on the chips was that the gooey cheese sauce could be ladled up quickly and had a long shelf life. Despite the sauce not technically being cheese, according to the FDA, it was an immediate hit and outsold every other food item at the stadium in 1976. Even better for the concessions business was that nacho sales also resulted in a large spike in beverage purchases, as you might expect from people consuming a sauce with jalapeno juice in it that was lathered on salty chips. Just as importantly, the introduction of nachos didn't seem to negatively impact things like hot dog and popcorn sales. This latter potential issue was a big concern Liberto frequently heard when he pitched his nachos at various event groups. Within a year of this, with an eye on moving more into the lucrative movie theater concessions industry, Liberto purchased Associated Popcorn, which was a major supplier of various theaters in Texas. This, combined with John Rowley of United Artist Theaters discovering Liberto's nachos, saw gooey cheese nachos hit the concession stands in theaters across the state. As for how nachos became more mainstream nationwide, this is thanks to their being served at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium in 1978. At the time, the Cowboys were known as America's team and often played host to ABC's Monday Night Football. The announcing team for those gamers included the legendary Howard Kossel. The story goes, at least according to Liberto's son, that while trying to fill dead air during a blowout, Kossel groped around for things to talk about and remarked on how delicious his snack was. He was, at the time, eating nachos. Whether this really was his original motivation or not, Kossel did indeed begin to describe plays on air as a nacho, as in, that was a nacho run, and extolled the virtues of the tasty snack frequently. Not long after this, stadium nachos were in every stadium across the country, thanks to his near-constant promotion of the food. Unfortunately, Nacho Anaya Sr. died in 1975, so was never able to see a version of his culinary invention being talked about in front of a nationally televised audience. Today, there's reportedly a bronze plaque up in Piedras Negras that honors the creator of this Mexican hors d'oeuvre. Additionally, October the 21st is considered International Day of the Nacho. No matter the day or place, however, according to Anaya's granddaughter in an interview with the San Antonio Express News in 2002, nachos today just don't taste as good as the original. She states, the chips are different. They're not homemade chips like he used to do. Or maybe it's the hands of the chef. 
So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Just before you go, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Cheddar. As I mentioned at the start of this video, you might know Cheddar from their live news network and their product reviews on Facebook, but now they are making YouTube videos. And if you like our stuff, you will probably like their stuff as well. So be sure to check them out. Now, if you like today's video, you should definitely check out the one they made about the most expensive nachos in America. Check out their video for more on that link in the description below. But for now, just let me play you out with a little preview. Again, you can watch the rest of it on their channel link in the description below thanks to cheddar for sponsoring and thank you for watching today we're at the park hyatt hotel in new york to taste their 210 dollar caviar topped russian nachos my name is sebastian archambault i'm the executive chef at the park at new york my parents own restaurants so since five years old i spend all my vacation